Today, we are in danger of collapsing under the economic weight of uh, the management of chronic disease. By any measure, they are the world's greatest remaining health problems. They absorb an increasing amount of uh, GDP in the developed countries, and they're emerging as the developing world's biggest problems as well. I believe cardiovascular disease just hit number one in the developing world. If you have any doubt about the economic burden represented here, then pick up the book by Alex, The Ageless Generation, in your pack, and start reading from about page 135, and then come on back in. This graph shows the difference between the beginning of the last century and the end of it uh, with respect to disease burden. Uh, and two things are relevant in this graph. First, we got really good at battling infectious disease. And second, even though we had enormous progress in the field, we didn't get very good at all at eradicating any of the age-related disease, nor even in reducing the economic burden of them. So what happened with infectious disease that hasn't happened with chronic disease? Well, it's very simple. We move to a culture of prevention. We put energy and resources into attacking the diseases before they hit, and we were very successful. And now, in all but the most intractable of cases, we have reduced, and in some cases, retired the burden of the associated disease permanently. Our foundation budget this year uh, is about $5 million. Most of that goes into research. Uh, to compare that with what goes on in the United States, inside of the Division of Biology of Aging in the NIA, they spend, we think, about $10 million on this kind of translational work. Um, it's hard to measure because nobody really measures this. Uh, that's cut from a $160 million budget for that division, which is cut from that billion dollar budget for that institute. That's cut from the $30 billion for the NIH. And that itself is just a drop of the $1.2 trillion we'll be spending just in the U.S. on health care for seniors just this year. Uh, there's an ocean of health care costs out there for seniors, and we're putting a tiny, tiny drop into prevention. So, uh, so how do we change that? The paradigm for treating aging right now is to treat disease. Uh, and what we want to do is treat damage. Treating disease means you have to wait until there's something wrong. You have to wait until you're sick before we can treat you. And it means any treatment to be approved usually needs to demonstrate a one-to-one -one correspondence in correcting the pathology. It's a sort of a perversion of the first do no harm part of the Hippocratic Oath, uh, where right now, with our chronic disease burden, we're often waiting until it's too late to really do anything before we try to do anything about the problem. Um, you remember these two flagship programs I was talking about. We'll go back to what I was talking about as being important about these applications. They're treatments that will be labeled for a disease, but they will apply to early damage rather than late stage disease by design. In one case, macular degeneration, and the other, athro. Uh, and that'll be an introductory paradigm for pushing these kinds of technologies into the market and making the market understand uh, that these are really cost effective and efficient drugs and interventions. And that's fine as a starter. It's fine where one kind of damage will relate to one kind of disease and will fix it. And serendipitously, we have a couple of those programs going. The problem is, let me bring this slide up again, uh, most of these diseases of age don't really eventually operate on just a one-to-one -one basis. Many kinds of damage have to be corrected before you might see progress in the prevention of any specific disease. Uh, Eli Lilly's trials for Alzheimer's drugs uh, might be an example here. They had phase three trials that removed amyloid plaque but didn't stop the disease, didn't meet their clinical endpoints. Uh, maybe there were damage factors that were not remitted. Uh, maybe neurofibroid tangles needed to be removed. Maybe cell therapy needed to be done. I'm not the expert on the science in this, but the bottom line message I want to give you is that there may be a drug that might be very effective in reducing or repairing a type of damage that may never see the market. I know they're re-enrolling now, but there's no guarantee that this ever gets out. Um, but I want to leave you with an idea to play with. This is, this is just an idea, uh, a suggestion that the business model for drugs like that could, could start to change in our direction a little bit. Um, Steve Burrell is of Burrell and Company. It's an investment company in the Bay Area. It's substantial life sciences involvement. 
Uh, he presented some interesting observations, which I'm putting up on the board here last week. It's uh, focused mostly on the emergence of large new healthcare markets and on the emergence of new tech and data technologies. Uh, these bullets are all straight from his slides with his permission, by the way. Uh, the upshot of his presentation is that there are two big changes coming our way. The first change is that there are countries, especially developing world countries, that are developing sophisticated healthcare systems for their populations, but they're doing it for the first time, and in some cases, almost from scratch. And for some reason, they aren't considering the U.S. model of gargantuan costs and lukewarm results to be their definition of the model system. <laughs> they're more interested in paying for overall results than in paying for services and drugs and interventions one at a time, like we do in the U.S. and for the most part here. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, pick up uh, William Hazeltine's book. It's called Affordable Excellence, and it's about Singapore and the emergence of their healthcare system. The second change is that we're entering an age of empowered consumers. Uh, medical customers will soon have access, as George noted, for the genome, for, uh, to their whole genomes for a few bucks. Um, Steve says we're going to have or have cell phones you can hold up to your heart and get an EKG readout. Once you're able to do that, I'm sure there's, the next day there's going to be 20 apps for a buck a piece that is going to give you a full interpretation of exactly what that readout means. Uh, these consumers are not going to be reliant on doctors for diagnoses uh, and procedures. They're going to be much more self-reliant. They don't want tests. They want correct diagnoses, they don't want medical procedures, they don't want drugs, they want medical outcomes, they want drug results. Uh, this could represent a move from a process-based model to a results-based model in the entire medical system. Uh, less about paying for procedures and processes, more about paying for the outcome. There's some evidence that this attitude may already be spilling over into the U.S. Uh, where changes in healthcare are enormously hard, as anybody who watches a political news show knows. Uh, but the Affordable Care Act actually has created some new incentives for cost control. It's created a new thing called accountable care organizations, with, which have to be responsible for certain outcomes. It's bundled some payments for outcomes. It's created an <coughs> institute for outcomes research. Uh, so okay, that's, uh, that's fine for controlling hospital bills. And if any of you read about that $900 bottle of saline solution IV uh, that got criticized a few weeks ago, uh, might stop that from happening. Uh, but in the developed world, we're going to protect the market for drugs, right? I mean, that's our bread and butter in the big pharma industry. We'd never do risk sharing to risk the threat of profits to drug interventions for chronic disease, right? I mean, that would be impossible, right? Well, in fact, we're already doing it. Uh, this is a list from Ernst & Young, a brief list of risk sharing agreements that right now provide reimbursements for drugs based on efficacy or refuse payment for non-efficacy. And this is all Europe and US, this is all developed world. And this looks like it, it might be a harbinger of the future of medical markets. Uh, and this might be, uh, I'll try to leave this up for a minute, uh, but I'm running very tight on time, so I won't go through the deals. But this could be real news for our foundation. We, uh, SRF that is, we're promoting a general move toward the treatment of pre-disease damage. Quite loosely uh, call it the vaccination approach to age-related disease. The interventions we provoke, promote will be designed to prevent the initiation of age-related disease and keep the patient from becoming a patient. Uh, in theory, that should feed wonderfully into an outcomes-based model for management of chronic disease. Because right now you don't have any real other options. Uh, now, it'll definitely have to be mixed with a much, much better understanding of all the damage biomarkers of age-related disease and what we can possibly do about them. Uh, Lily's drug, if it doesn't cure Alzheimer's now, still won't uh, by itself. But that's exactly the kind of inquiry we're trying to promote, the foundation. Uh, if we could discover which set of interventions additively would prevent Alzheimer's completely, we could transform the outcomes model. Uh, right now, it's easy to imagine improved diagnostic tools with these great data technologies coming out. It's easy to imagine improved lifestyle management tools like using Fitbit, which uh, a lot of people I see here have one on right now, I'm sure. 
Uh, but if we're really going to forestall age-related disease, we're going to have to move to an outcomes model on a more wholesale basis. We're going to have to move to one that includes interventions that are comprehensive enough to fully prevent the diseases. And frankly, uh, we think that is only a sense model. 